Hello, everybody. I'm your host, Zenitsu, and you're listening to the DigiTalks podcast, the show that covers uh, various topics from news to meta developments and everything in between for the fine folks who love the Digimon trading card game. Just as a quick reminder, I do stream this live over on twitch.tv slash Zenitsu. It's also uploaded as a YouTube video under the channel of Zenitsu, as well as being on various podcasting platforms like Spotify for your viewing and listening pleasure. Today, I am changing things up, and I'm back with my teammates, Nikki and Guardian, and we are going to be talking about the Worlds event that just happened. The format for this was BT15 Post Restrictions, and we're going to be talking just in general about the event and what it means for the game and, well, for the BT15 meta going forward. So before we dive right into that, I do have Teddy's question of the week on hand. So Teddy's question of the week is, how do you feel world so it will change players' mentalities going forward? Will we see more control decks or will people try to counter those decks more often? So uh, opening up the floor, what do you think, Nikki? Worlds, uh, worlds. What can you say? It, it, set, control just wins. And honestly, I, I play pseudo control decks. Like, I think where we're going, like, other card games have kind of shown this off. Where like you start going away from control for the health of the game to get into grind game kind of decks, where it's less about like I just you know win because you can't do anything, and it's more so like. I don't care what you do because I'll just grind through it. I'll just I'll have more resources than you have to bank. And I think that's that where no Yu-Gi-Oh kind of has shown that quite often. Yeah. As an like, example. Like yeah. I play Mirage, I play Bugs. Um I don't care what happens to me. I'm just going to keep grinding this out. I'm going to neutralize the game state. We're simplifying things down and someone's going to work from there. To me, that's a good game of Yu-Gi-Oh. Uh, Yu-Gi-Oh. Good game <laughs> of Digimon. Uh, but world world is gonna start hitting stuff real hard, like control and combo wise, and it is gonna be a ride. Yeah. Uh, on that subject, that's where I would like, before we get into too far of anything on this discussion, I would like to point out the overtime rule. Bondi and dropped the ball one too many times with control decks like this. They would often just force the game into time and get the win through that way. I honestly think Bondi should change the rulings punish slow playing punish the time just like overall try to change the mindset and improve the game state are you doing that because you think because of worlds we're going closer to control decks uh actually i think we're more pushing towards a security control kind of meta so control basically so, so then, yeah, the answer to the question is yes. You think we're going more towards a control kind of... Like, Worlds is going to cause more of a control kind of deck uh, renaissance, if you will. Well, mm -hmm. even if we just... Uh, before we go over the top decks uh, more specifically, uh, all four of the top four decks from Worlds were borderline control decks. Digimon is generally a game that is very resource intensive in terms of managing your resources, mitigating RNG, or controlling it as much as you possibly can, and uh, it rewards more proactive plays. So the fact that four control decks came out and basically just took the entire tournament really shows when Bandai doesn't know how to control their, well, control their control, uh, things tend to get a little bit out of hand in the control decks favor versus like the more proactive decks. And uh, we're going to get into the more specifics uh, in the podcast like later. Uh, but Teddy also has another statement to kind of kick this transition off. So Teddy states that in regards to uh, 2024 Worlds Tournament, Overall, he enjoyed watching the games and believed uh, the players did a great job. Uh, congratulations to Peter on winning it for using security control. And I will preface the statement with saying that there is no reason to give any hate to the players at all, even if they did play control decks and things did go to time. Uh, the way uh, they feel is best and uh, yes, overall, most of the sentiment that 
uh, security control one, and that's lame. But I don't want people to hate on others just because they made a good meta call. Uh, I do think that security control, like this is uh, taking a break from Teddy's comment to kind of comment on it. Um, the winning deck of Worlds was security control. And like, yes, we shouldn't hate the players for picking a good deck for the meta. So if anyone's unfamiliar with Worlds... Worlds is basically a super locals. So there's just 16 players and they're just playing around uh, three rounds of Swiss and then going into top four top cut. So we saw the two of the top cut rounds. We didn't see any of the Swiss and taking a deck like security control, especially with altered time rules, because there is no ties. Ties are not allowed. Uh, taking a deck like Security Control was just a good meta pick, especially into a field of aggro where your security could just win you the game, which we saw happen on stream, uh, on top of various other things that happened on stream. But we'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, so continuing where I left off, um, just because you don't like the way a deck functions, it doesn't mean that players uh, did not play the deck well and it didn't perform well under pressure of world's environment just be kind to each other um as we're all playing the same game there's no reason to hate on each other uh, i also think that the time rolls should be updated to fix what should have not really uh transpired and they really need to sit down and do some more thinking on that uh should uh things should incentivize games to actually finish Rather than just going to time, that's just his opinion. He's interested in seeing what your opinions are in the comments as well as I am. So, to kind of preface this and recap, um, Security Control did end up winning Worlds. Uh, the other th uh, three decks that were in the top four were all other control decks, and they were all Leviamon. Uh, Leviamon, if you're unfamiliar with what he does, he basically comes in, blows up the field, and then just wants to hit the opponent really hard for being on the field. Uh, but the important thing is how he's controlling the field is utilizing his options. His options obviously have their own built-in removal attached to them on top of being able to play him. That also, now he's removing things even further. So you could kind of see just the pattern of removal is really good. And clearing the field and security threats are very important. And most decks aren't running security threats because they don't have the deck space to it. And what they can run is very limited compared to something like Security Control and Leviathan. But watching the event uh, was, for me personally, really painful. Not only because I don't like Security Control, I do have an anti-Security Control bias, but because all of the games... Uh, well, at round one uh, against uh, Taka, uh, that one didn't go to time. But in the finals, the game did end up going to tie. Taka lost because he got decked out. And then Frozen lost because of time rules being heavily in favor of security control because there is no tie allowed. Usually in most other events... A tie will just happen, and then security control just goofs themselves. But when ties can't happen, security control is now heavily favored, because uh, what's one of the first things that they look at? Isn't it cards and deck or security? I forgot. So, so I want to I want to interrupt here. First because, thing they look at this, is actually the security first, then the decks. So I want to interrupt here, actually, because th this happened. The, the worlds went against us, actually. So when it was to talk, um, when it came down to one of the games. Bandai immediately went back on the. There is a the policy for the time rules what is in place. They immediately contradicted themselves, and that happened first with the Taka. Um, people were making um, like there the chatter was because like it was very confusing, and even Pete showed off on the stream that he was confused that he won because it, the time rules weren't followed correctly, and he was given the win because of it. So that was like his round against Taka, and then he went into semifinals, and again the time rules. Because Taka had won the first, had his tiebreakers were better, so it it became 
oh, you will draw this game because you can't draw, Taka will proceed because his tiebreakers are better than yours. But they immediately just gave it to, to, to Pete instead. Because that's how North America does it. It's like, if okay, you guys will have to end up just like, we're going to time, no, no absolute winner, uh, tiebreakers. Or you both tie and, you know, we'll go from there. But because there is no tiebreakers allowed, Pete just went better because uh, because it is security first, cards in deck, bodies on board, and then like it, it's like a whole like ten step process because the, the game is specifically designed to where there is no draw, somebody has to win, and it's like exactly as I said, it's the security first, the Digimon on board, the the cards left in your deck, the amount of Digimon on board, and then whoever can like sudden death whoever gets to lethal first right and in a format where or like that's allowed and you have a deck like security control which barely draws cards so they're most likely going to have more cards in deck and the whole point of the deck is to heal which means they're most likely going to have more security and even in like sudden death uh because i believe sudden death is like first security change uh literally all security control has to do is play magna angemon heal and the game is done because now they have so, more security and the security changed. So uh, in the final game against Frozen, Bandai did a weird sudden death. It was whoever has more security at the end of the, the four turns. Yeah, which still favors security control because they could heal. So all mm -hmm. all security control need to do is raise out a rookie, swing once with that rookie, break a security, and then just constantly have heal cards and he's automatically going to be winning the game. Yeah. He, Pete did the, the, the combo of set convert. He was at equal life, um, and then he went, okay, I'm going to go Air Dramon. He looks at his life, finds the Magnet Angie, and adds it to his hand and recovers, and then plays that said Magnet Angie, and then it's just like, the game is over. The game is already over. Yeah, which I think, uh, like, I think on the world stage, that's extremely embarrassing on Bandai's part. Like, not mm -hmm. only did like the games not feel very rewarding to watch because of just the nature of security control, but it was a very confusing and awkward way to just win out against the opponent. Uh, again, I think like for that style of event, they all picked very strong decks. Um, and I think this was a good insight into what our BT 15 meta, the rest of it is going to look like. But I feel like for as a celebration, as something they want to promote, this basically just put the full errors and issues of the game on display for everyone at the highest caliber they possibly could. And I think that's just egg on Bandai's face for uh, not necessarily allowing because they couldn't control what these players were going to be bringing, but for just the way everything was handled was just not very well done. And I think mm -hmm. that's the big takeaway is they just, they need to change some of these rules, not necessarily to prevent these types of decks from doing this well in this style of event, uh, but just because they themselves were confused on what was supposed to happen and the event just obviously was not very interesting to watch. One person doing all of the work, doing all of the critical thinking, doing everything, and then the other person playing basically uh, the equivalent of Magic Draw Go. Um, it's not exactly Draw Go, but uh, in Magic, no, there, I there's... I exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, in Magic, uh, people hate on control decks because of counter spells. So yeah, it's just cough, like... Cough. Yeah, so they'll literally draw a card and then pass their turn because... They know they just have the lands up to be able to play a counterspell to stop the opponent from literally playing the entire game, um, which is not fun. And security control is basically the equivalent where it's just like, uh, I'm going to draw, heal, and then pass. And then that's mm -hmm. his entire turn. And then it just is up to the opponent to find a way to navigate around security control, which is 100% doable. It's just the adaptability based on the deck sometimes is harder than others, especially like purple decks they generally draw and cycle a lot so they're more prone to mill themselves out on top of security control trying to grind their resources down to nothing to put them in that state so it was like things were just actively working against purple allowing security control to have an easier time to win yeah because um taka in in semifinals 
uh, he learned. Um, so the art, the thing with uh, JP was that they knew about SecCon, but it wasn't popular in JP. It was very much a North America thing because of Magic. We we played Magic longer, so we're used to those pass, 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 pass. Like we're grinding, we're like grinding to a halt. We're just countering each other. This is like what we call fun, but in JP, to them that concept is alien. And like Taka. In, like, the first game, he, he got blown out because he didn't understand it. But then game three, he realized, oh, oh, you, you, your deck just sucks. And then he went with, like, two Leviathans, check six security. And, like, he figured it out. But the problem just became, even though you figured it out, when you go degrade, hell scythe, you can't play stuff by effects. And, like, getting punished by the the techs uh, Pete was playing, it just became what is normally, like, a... Like, rough matchup gets a little bit worse, but it's just, like, navigating that is just hard when, like... Uh, there was one turn where Taka had lethal, and next turn he, he he went for lethal, but, like, he was scared because he, he understood security is dangerous. At the same time, I can't risk staying here waiting for you to remove me from the board. I just need to go now. If I wait... If I die, I die. I know it's not there anymore, but if I wait too long, it doesn't matter if it wasn't there or not. You have it in your hand. Yes. Uh, and that adaptability was very interesting to see. It was just, it, it came a little bit too late. And that goes uh, exactly what you were saying, Nikki. Uh, those types of decks and that type of playstyle is, for the most part, kind of alien to uh, Japanese players because uh, Japanese game design is all about big hyper explosiveness. Like they like big and flashy. Whether it's balanced or not, doesn't matter. They just love also big, new, exciting new hyper flashy too. Yes. Uh they just love whatever is the newest thing. They love whatever is just hyper explosive and uh super flashy. That's that's just what they enjoy. They don't like slow, grindy control games because their culture also is different where uh Japan is a very fast-moving place. Uh, things are always bustling. Things are always happening. People are coming in and out. That's why Japanese uh, meta is best of one, is because of time's sake. They don't want to spend 50 minutes playing a single game. They hate that. So playing security control on decks like that, at purposely and actively doing nothing but slowing and stalling the game is something they just do not even want to think about. It's also good to remember, for the Japanese, they're used to a best of one game. So, like, they're... It's more so, like, they don't mind playing the longer game, but it's the understanding of, this is my one chance to win. I don't get a game two. I don't get game three. I don't get to come back. It's, I win now with super explosive flashiness that pays off, or I get punished for it. And that's just the way it goes. It, it's a best of one format. Like, I, yeah. I can't cry about it. I can't complain about it. Like, it's just we're going now this is what we're going at in, in north america you have the best two out of three right so you get to like kind of experience it but like for them it's like again hyper flashy best of one like it's super rewarding to them it's also super punishing for them too because if they get blown out they get blown out mm -hmm. but if they blow somebody out they blow somebody out yeah but it's easier and more digestible when that happens in 10 to 15 minutes versus uh 50 minutes where you just kind of can't. And mm -hmm. that's unfortunately what security control does. And I do think like when security control is at its best is when the game is at its worst and seeing security control show off the errors of the game on full display is like one of the biggest embarrassments that I have as a player as well, because this is the best that we got. Uh, and I, I get it. It is just, a super locals, they just pick the decks, and uh, uh, Pete just picked the right meta call. I can't blame him for that. He played very well. Um, the finals match also kind of was a little bit sloppily played. I think there could have been some tightening up on uh, Frozen's play aspect of it. But at the end of the day, he did end up getting to Worlds, uh, which is more than 99% of people can say. Um, and obviously stress and pressure must have been absolutely insane on him. And it, it's just unfortunate the way the whole event played out. 
Uh, similar to like One Piece, which was uh, streamed what before or after? I don't remember. But seeing in One Piece all of the decks basically be the same is also egg on Bandai's face because that's basically showing off. This is a tier zero format. There's nothing but mirrors, and like it's it's just not not good from a presentation and a company standpoint. Mm-hmm. But uh, going more specifically into the decks, unless you have something else you want to add about the event itself. No, we, we kind of said it. it, it Honestly, it's a yeah. Toxic. It's a little, a little bit? Uh, yeah, okay. L- l- let's, like, where do, where do you want to go from here, Zen? You want to do the top 16 breakdown or do you want to do the, to the top four winner lists? Um, we'll do top 16 breakdown because I think this is just a good direction on, uh, actually, no, we'll, we'll do that last because that's a better transition into where we think BT15 is going to go. So we're going to cover the top four decks, um, because we do have their deck lists. So obviously let's start, let's start with Pete. Let's start with the winner because this one's a lot easier to go through. The, the other three are all relatively the same and it'll be easier to, to just kind of be like, this is tech one, this is tech two, this is tech them for what they chose. The, the set con list is a bit more nuanced. Yes. Uh, so the Pete ended up winning Worlds with Security Control. And his Security Control list was more akin, not necessarily to what we were used to playing Security Control for like the past couple of sets. It actually is like a Renaissance list that's taking a lot of pages from like the BT9 era of Security Control lists. So uh, he's running his classic security control core, which is going to be Chaos Degrade, Hellsythe, uh, BT1 Magnet, Angemon. Uh, then you have the Karis, the TK and Kari, and the Venusmon, as well as the Salamon as the primary actually, rookie. Venus is actually it is kind of the tech, actually. Um, so... Un- Venusmon is specifically what I think Pete chose for this tech. Like, Venusmon has good matchups against anything because you can give them the blanket minus one. But it's also the fact that Levy, because we are post BT15 restricted, the only purple decks you need to worry about right now is kind of just Levy Aluga. I could see of that. Of which they do get the security attack. Yeah, Levios have the modifier regardless of what happens. And Luga gets, Luga it, via gets alliance. it on alliance too. So if they alliance, they they do not want to alliance first. Because yeah, you get the modifier, and then you it, it falls off. But it's the fact that when you're doing when you're resolving when attacking, you have to declare the alliance last, so that way all your triggers can resolve. Because if you declare the alliance first, you don't get anything. Yeah, um... on that on that bit. Combining the Venus with Shadow Serafi is a very good play in most cases. Because if you can get around the minus one check, sure, you can't really do much, but then you can't really get around being de-digivolved immediately after. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's definitely a very hard combo pair of level sixes. Uh then the new inclusions obviously is going to be the Magna Angemon Ace, which is basically the same exact thing as BT1, just on play recover. Uh this also just happens to have uh a security limit of five. Uh, but most of the time, you're not going to be exceeding. It's also that. the built in removal. And you do yeah, get the, rid of a lot of chances. Because if you're at- at like say ten security, that's gonna be able to wipe out a mega on its own. Yeah, even though generally it wouldn't speaking, recover. But yeah, but it's the just fact generally that... speaking, it, it clears a champ. Which for decks that realize I need to build wide, they'll hard drop the champ for five, maybe six, and they're at most six thousand DP on the level four stage. This will just immediately wipe them out if they weren't touched yet. Right, which is why the newest inclusion, Angelmon, is a really good tech card because not only does she have an alternative way to recover on both players' turns, uh, it is just a flat out minus six k where Magna Angelmon is not a guaranteed minus six k. So it's it's just another really strong Ace Digimon that they also could use because he is playing Air Dramon, which allows you to just search your security for a Digimon and then just add it to your hand and recover. So while that's sitting on the field putting pressure, uh, it gives you the opportunity to Ace for free, which is just really, really strong running that fifth Ace. Uh, and then Pillowmon is a good tech to just shut down decks that play Digimon by card effects, which are a lot of decks now. Um, yeah, and mm-hmm. I want to I want to speak up on the aces a little bit because of the Azulong Mon Ace. The Azulong Mon Ace, I want to just a small tangent. 
Azulong long Azulong Mon Ace, all the David Aces are really strong for being the ace. And this is what we needed aces to be. Because it does like if they swing on your first ace, you don't care acing on ace because you get to bounce the level five. And in a lot of matchups that can either A, I'm removing the body that's attacking to me, or I don't I won't let you get another swing at me. But it also has the caveat, oh, if you do kill me, I'll kill something for you. And that happened to Taka, and I felt really bad for him. Because yeah. he saw he, he got tunnel vision. He was like, Oh, I'm just gonna kill Zulong Mon with your ace under it. I'm gonna get like seven memory. Cool, but you don't get memory now because you you get my overflow, but I'm gonna kill you first, so you don't get the Levia's effect to get you memory either. And now you just lost your single body. Yeah. And then uh the last Digimon uh is going or well there's two digimon left uh there's death x which is death x just a no-brainer uh good for wide fields and then there is uh magna and or not magna angemon uh magna kidmon which just lets you throw all of your Magic options kidmon. back into your trash so you don't deck yourself out because games actually can go that long uh and okay. it's not like the deck has an insane draw engine their eggs is literally just um upamon from bt3 and then it is uh, the one Vixie. Yeah, the the one Vixie Mon because you're using high level or like high costed options, so it's just an easy free draw uh, while mm -hmm. something is sitting on the field. Then when it comes to the Tamers, as we already mentioned, they're just running the Kari, TK Kari, and uh, Purple Kari. Uh, the spicy tech here is the Digimon Emperor to shut off like Ukamon Rush style decks. Uh, the extra draw in memory can come up, but the idea is they're going to raise and lose their turn because I'm going to try choking them. And this card just, it just can do a lot of work against those flood style decks. Uh, it is also its own um, draw engine because um, there's only four degrades in the deck. So every other option that can be removal aside from the Lunky uh, is DP deletion. So you will get to draw a card off of the effect because a level five or higher is deleted, I think. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's still just another really good card. It it covers both ends of the spectrum, rewards you for killing their big things, and punishes them for having small things. It's like the the double, it's like having two edges of the sword on one side, where it's all in your favor. Even though like mm -hmm. the card is white, that doesn't matter. Um, and then the rest of the options is just mostly just staples in terms of removal options so you have your lone key you have your wyvern's breath you have your chaos degrade hell scythe uh the new inclusions is going to be uh revelation of light Fish which light. yeah which is basically like a little board wipe so it's just more small body so removal. that's only if it's checked in security uh pete used it the in hand effect is you get to look at your security and add, and either i think it's either add one among them or play one among them it pl it plays a level four or lower so yeah, if you just, activate Revelation of Light, you basically Dramon. can see Aerodramon in security and go, oh, look, I'm going to play this for free. Yeah, but yeah, the security threat the is also power. still relevant, especially if exactly. you have a Kari, because it does want Kari to be on the field, which you're running... Plus, it gives you the knowledge, which does matter. Yeah, and then uh, you also have uh, one of the most broken options that security control can have, which is uh, Lament of Friendship, to just basically be able to recycle whatever Digimon you want. Uh, so most of the time they try to use this with a little loop with Avenge Kidmon, where it's just like, I'm going to lament my Avenge Kidmon back and then Avenge Kidmon throw my lament back into my deck. So there's there's that little combo. But the fact that they could just grab whatever they want out of their trash, borderline for no real like heavy resource cost to them, is like absolutely insane. Mm-hmm. And being a three cost option is even more insane on that one. Yeah. So the deck is just a really solid security control shell with just a whole bunch of like random tech cards for situations that may or may not come up. And well, the the fact that there was just a lot of tech and he was able to see the tech meant that it was all it was very clearly working and uh it did very well for him. Uh mm -hmm. then going on to second place. It is a Leviamon deck. Uh, a yeah, lot of the Leviamon first. decks are doing something very similar. The majority of it is like Seven Lightning, Biting Crush, Leviah, Leviah X, and Dragomon. Uh, that's like the core and heart of the deck. And then there's a couple of like 
small little tech options from there. So uh, I'm also seeing Werewolf or Cerberus X also in a lot of these lists. Yeah, That's because on, it's a level um, 5 X. That's the only reason. Yeah. So, so let's take a look at Taka's first because Taka... They're, they're all unique, but I think Taka has the right idea because looking at the other lists, there are notable changes that I think have punished people because of it. So let's start with Taka. The reason I say Taka first is because Taka had a more grindy game with Satcom that gave him a win. Uh, the other ones won as well, but like this is like a guaranteed like. Taka's list had, had the Cerberus X, it. right? Cerberus X is with the the proto forms. Yeah. Because um, looking at this list, the proto forms are what gave him that edge in the Setcon matchup. Because no matter what left the board, he was able to. Re like to fix his hand because a lot of times able to reverse would die, he would grab whatever piece he was that was vital to getting another stack out and that helped him like grind those games out yeah this, and this then is also not on biting crush too yeah and he's less on the gurman engine and he's more on the cerberus engine which i think is a pretty decent uh tech call because you are very limited in the gurman engine since it got hit a lot and I think that just the draw and discard off of what the server spawn engine does on top of actually having a level five X antibody Digimon you want to use is very relevant, especially for uh, proto form, because then you could just go up into that a little bit cheaper or you could go up into Levi X a little bit cheaper. It's it's just a very solid inclusion. And uh, it also matters because because you have proto form, uh, Taka would trigger it on the Cerberus because Cerberus, sorry, not Cerberus, on uh, Dober, because Dober gets all, all his effects when he has the X-Antibody and it's mainly just the strategy of I'm just going to flood the board. I'm just going to flood this board. It doesn't matter if you kill me because I have more bodies than you do at the end of the day. Yeah, and the uh, the floodgate that he's running is Gazimon. I think all of them are running Gazimon. Psychmon yeah. has kind of just faded because the fact that we're playing more Digimon by card effects and we're not reducing their cost anymore. Makes it so that it's not as good, which means Gazimon is going to have more of an impact because there is still a lot of ways that decks want to cheese and gain free memory. At least in this meta. When we head into BT16 meta, the meta is going to shift again. E I mean, the meta shifts every set. Uh, but... I know for EX6, uh, Psychmon will definitely come back out for the Demon Lords deck. But in BT sixteen, but uh, Demon Psych Lords isn't gonna... as strong as Ragnar Lord if we go that route. Yeah, but it's still the idea that we have we had this format of APOC, of Royal Knights, and of Demon Lords. Where Psychmon is good for the format, but heading into BT sixteen format, it is mainly a DNA format and bugs, birds, and like just general aggression Where's format. DNA in sixteen. Imperial, uh, Sylphie, Imperial yeah, in and... Imperial and Sylphie. Hmm. those are the two more prominent ones uh you could say that shako is still there but shako out of uh the three kind of was performing the worst in japan not that it's bad uh it's just it had a lot of hype and excitement that ended up leading to nowhere it's because other the decks level can... sixes for the jogras are what matters like um blue black only got access to vikemon but sophie gets access to uh, to valkyrmon like yeah, Valkyrie which Valkyrie really is age. insane, but that's mm -hmm. that's looking too far ahead. But going back to Frozen's list, you could kind of see after looking at Takas, there was a decent amount of tech changes where Frozen is still on the Garurumon package. He's subsidizing it with more rare mons and Octomon, which I think is fine. And then mm -hmm. the big change outside of the Garurumon package versus the Cerberus is the fact that he's teching in some Gilmons for those long games to be able to have some extra rush because you know a three cost rusher is like insane to close out games with uh his x antibody is in proto form it is actually like base x antibody maybe to try to anti-tempo but because he's not really running a whole lot of x antibodies maybe slide it under leviamon go into Leviah x uh on attack just to be able to remove on attack like it's there's some cute stuff you could do with it but Without a level five X, I could definitely see like some interesting differences between what the lists are attempting to do on 
how their play lines are. He is playing the Waru Seedramon to be able to just spawn an extra body to have onto the opponent's field to trigger some of your abilities. But again, you can see the majority of it is just, I'm going to draw, discard, set up my Biting Crushes, hope my security has enough security threats, and then just try to Leviamon and kill you with Leviamons. Mm -hmm. uh, and then third place is is almost like a happy mix between the two where it's just like it's a little bit of one and it's a little bit of the other so i i think like between the different approaches to leviamon we kind of got a good spread um which i think is funny and kind of cool mm -hmm. so those are the majority of the top four again it was all control decks because i wouldn't label leviamon as an aggro deck it was all control decks uh, and I would say Levi is more uh, is more mid range. It has the potential. I control, wouldn't say otherwise because attacks. of how Levi X runs itself. It likes to be in the trash. So I'd say it, I agree with Zan. It's more of a control deck than anything. For what I Digimon is, I would label it as a control deck because control in Digimon is a little bit different than other decks. It's a broader statement. It, yes, because a lot of decks have built in control and removal, but it's like when. What is the point of the removal? Because, like, you look at a deck like Lugamon, and he just does it when he swings based on his board state. But that's not his end goal. That's not what he's trying to do. He just has that baked into his package. Uh, Leviamon is solely trying to remove bodies and force the opponent to have bodies to remove them. Um, so that's kind of where I'm leaning on calling Leviah a control deck. But as far as the top 16 breakdown, because, you know, there was only 16 players. Uh, like I said, winner was security control, and then top four was the rest of them were Leviamons. And out of the event, there actually was four, I'll say 4.5 Leviamons, because the Anubismon was also a Leviamon deck. Uh, they just labeled it as Anubis cross Levia, um, instead of mm -hmm. just having a fifth Leviamon deck. But the fact that four out of, or three out of five Leviamon decks made it into finals that shows that it was a very strong control deck. It was very good for the meta and uh, it had a pretty good high conversion rate in the hands of good players, which is generally what purple excels at. Uh, then we also had two red hybrids, two bloom Lords, two Numimons, one shine, one mirage, one uh, Fang long, one security control and one Fenrir Lugamon. Um, I would like to note here that the it's also the fact that a lot of decks uh, you have two, three, four, five, six maybe decks that just cannot handle having their tamers blown up, which Leviathan also excels at. Yeah, tamer removal is always like super important. That's why um, Black War Greymon was so big in BT11 was because he was just one of the best cards and best decks to be able to remove tamers again in a very tamer heavy and tamer centric deck or like format because we was in like we were in mid cross era when that deck was like super prominent and then we just kind of not necessarily shifted away from that it's just he became less good because of the other tools that uh was entering the meta mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so overall i think this is a pretty good meta spread and because this is a solid meta spread, this is kind of like the base or foundation for what a lot of players are probably going to be looking at in terms of what to expect out of BT15's meta. So, like, if I was just a bypasser and I was looking to play in BT15 and I'm undecided on what deck I would play, let hey, here's Worlds. <laughs> uh, yeah, the most budget one that would be available to a player just coming in would actually be the security control on that one. Uh, no, no it would probably be Mirage. No. I I think it would honestly still be Mirage. Mirage and so, uh, Shine uh, are still actually cute. the the order it would go in is Shine Red Hybrid. They're both relatively cheap. Um, you don't you don't need anything higher than a super rare with literally your sixes and maybe honestly sevens. Honestly, the Red Hybrid maybe fall out of that. As I was well, watching like, the market watch ten, earlier. Ten on Emperor, like, I mean, okay. I haven't checked prices in a bit, but like that's roughly a forty to sixty dollar deck. Mirage and Burst are somewhere in that ballpark of like, despite Aces, you probably are in that same ballpark. Fenrir is super expensive now, um, due to needing the analog use, the Chimera Mons, and your Fenrirs, which are about five each for every single piece. Um, that's a little bit pricier. 
Uh, the Anubis, Levia, Levia stuff has immediately spiked because of World, so that is no. It was not playable then because of the EX5 bad pull rate, so now it's even more so. Fang Lung I mean, is already 80 for the deck. Yeah, I mean, your, but your prices, prices aside, if I was trying to be competitive at the game, this is what the most competitive people in the world are looking at for this format. So mm -hmm. even though Bloom didn't exactly see any success in pre-restrictions, that doesn't necessarily mean he was a deck that I could just write off. No, it's the exact opposite, where now he might be more viable, uh, especially depending on how things develop. I just think that in the face of a deck like Leviamon, it probably was not the smartest idea to pick because you're just hoping that you have a wide enough field where all of the removal just can't clear everything. But I think that's just a very bad mentality. But regardless, like the fact that players are looking at this because Bloom does have some explosive turns, especially on the, the crackback, means that this is like, the foundation of what bt15 is going to be and i think like because of this this is not a bad spread like sure we had the control decks basically win the event in the face of some really good aggro decks but uh and i guess technically combo decks as well but the fact that we do have the ability to play so many decks and this is also before Terriermon even comes out so Terriermon also is going to be shaking things up a little bit as well because its ability to stop anybody from digivolving is what's going to be a very strong part of it right and it also has some pretty decent aggro and control elements I would say Terriermon is definitely more of that mid-rangey deck where it does have the flexibility to do whatever it kind of wants at any given moment but regardless mm -hmm. like this just shows that be, even though Security Control won, which a lot of people don't like mostly just because it's Security Control, there's still just a lot of health in the format. And again, certain decks were doing better because they knew there was never going to be a tiebreaker. So I saw a, uh, a Facebook post talking about like the tiebreak rules on how it really severely favored Security Control. But now that... that we're not applying that to the entire game and it's just for this event security control might go back to a more quelled state especially with a whole bunch of uh meta shakeups because i know numimon it has a pretty decent security control matchup because of how much advantage it's able to gain yeah because it's just like go ahead kill me i don't care i'm just gonna go ahead and do what i'm gonna do yeah so um and again, we don't exactly know how Terriermon and uh, the deck is going to be influenced. And even though um, a lot of BT16 decks are going to change what we're playing from BT15, we still could use some of that information to gauge what we could potentially play because we also got a new uh, Magnamon in the starter deck as well. So now maybe blue hybrids can make a resurgence even though it might not be as powerful without the BT-16 stuff, that's still something people are looking at, especially, uh, I know we kind of mentioned budget, on the budget side, if you're going to try to line yourself up for a format, you want to try to get the cards earlier, so building the deck and getting seasoned and practiced with it now isn't necessarily the worst ideas if you know that's what you're going to want to play in the next format. Audience, he means... So, I honestly was just looking at the prices here, and Nume is actually a lot more cheaper than it used to be. That that's the only problem with Nume, dropped. yeah. The only problem with Nume is gonna be the level sevens and the Monzimon from Resurgence Booster. Resurgence booster is why I'm saying this. It's right so, now at ten dollars okay. a copy. Let me let me interrupt here. Because I bought I had to buy my new maze at twenty. They dropped because someone bought them out. So like that that's good for people coming back, but for the people who were prepping, it sucked for us because I had to trade to try to get my new maze for not, you know, 25 a pop. And that sucked. Yeah, um, and now it... Because people have realized, oh, people want this card. Let's crack the product we had. It was a loss now, then, but now we can kind of, like, flood the market. And then as economics, you flood the market, you drop the price, and then you crash. Um, yeah. And then... Plus, technically, with Nume, you are flexible on the sevens. I've played the Levia and Nume decks uh, since Worlds, and I can testify that 
Numite doesn't necessarily need a seven. The sevens are more toolbox of like, I'm in a bad situation and I need a way to try to clear this. Um, I would not say the sevens are necessarily needed. Uh, playing the decks, I would have rather preferred more gas in the tank, which is what like I meant by like we need more grindy decks because Numa can absolutely flood the board. Uh, but the problem becomes if you have too many X's in your hand, you can't do anything because all the X's are a win digivolving effect. Well, I uh-huh. think like this is kind of. I, I was uh, watching a video about, like, triangle metas and how some people really don't like triangle metas because, like, it's just a guessing game. And they also don't like wider metas because then it becomes harder to prep for everything. And, like, I do get that type of a sentiment, but I also do like the fact that we do just have a decent amount of diversity because even if we just look at what Terriermon's inclusion does, Terriermon kind of dumpsters a little bit on Numemon. And then Numimon eats up on the control decks, and then the control decks eat up on Terriermon. So, like, you kind of have these, like, pseudo-triangles form out of the meta, and even though Security Control won Worlds, that doesn't necessarily mean it is the best deck. I think that, like, at the beginning, the question, we are going to see some more control decks uh, pop up because of this event. It doesn't necessarily mean that those are going to be what... Uh, is going to be winning at the end of the day. So I used to play competitive Hearthstone, if anyone's unfamiliar with that. Uh, and we had a saying where at the beginning of the meta starts with aggro and at the end of the meta ends with aggro. And I kind of hold that sentiment true to my heart, even uh, in various other card games that I play, even though I don't play Hearthstone anymore because, God, that was a train wreck. But regardless, um, I think that even though right now we're showing heavy control, now this is the part where players are going to start finding the decks and finding the tech and the cards to beat those controls. And then the control is going to have to try to find their way to adapt around it. Sometimes they can't, sometimes they can. And I think like Bandai kind of just needs, like if anything, this shows that Bandai really needs to keep their control decks in check. Otherwise they are just the best things ever because Leviathan hitting for like three checks while also wiping the entire field at any given moment is kind of silly, especially out of security. Mm -hmm. And I do think security at the end of the day is part of the problem with security control, but they're not going to retroactively like rewrite how security functions. That's just a baked in problem with the game itself. Uh, which is unfortunate, but what they can do is limit recovery tools. I'm not saying we need to just go out and limit um, Magna and Jumon, both of them. I would like that personally, just because I think recovery is annoying in that capacity. But um, at that point, they would just swap over to the Holy Wave option, which is even more annoying. But at least Holy Wave isn't a body that you then can ace with, because next set they're getting uh, Valkyrie X or valkyrie ace and that's going to be extra annoying on the control front um which is why like security control is not going to go away unless they hit the recovery tools in the form of digimon but we already know they're not going to i don't know if they're actually going to do anything about uh what happened at worlds in terms of trying to make the game better and i think that's the part that like worries me the most is the fact that you had Every single, almost every single problem on full display here. And the fact that, like, nothing would come from learning about the mistakes with the game itself. That's going to be the more alarming, like, problem. Because that, to me, shows that they can't learn and adapt from their own mistakes based on how players can play the game. Mm -hmm. And that's probably going to be what's going to be the knife on Digimon's throat until they actually can fix that. Because there was a time back in like Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh's history where those two companies could not adapt for whatever such and such reason. And they finally learned, oh, we need to go pushing this way instead of what we've been doing. And Bandai just needs to learn, hey, all our other games are struggling just like this one. Maybe we should try and look elsewhere. Try to get more ideas, more flux in how we adjust this game i think like the the answers to me are like actually painfully obvious uh stop making security bombs the way that they are 
and stop making recovery that is just generic and can just be highly abusable. Like, those are the two things that they need to do in order to keep security control in check. They're already doing a good job because you get cards like Bugs and you get cards like uh, Magnamon uh, in the next set where they just can't be touched uh by certain effects which does limit the Magnamon amount of control it's immunity yeah magnamon's immune to everything bugs are only immune to digimon yeah but i mean controls can come more from option like control is more than just options as well so the fact that like if i have a digimon that has heavy control aspects like gallantmon where i just want to kill everything now you have a way to prevent that from happening granted too much like protection can be very harmful in of its own right but just enough can really just keep certain things in check and at bay and i really liked when they started doing burning security because now you're bypassing the security check and like they're slowly coming to ways to be able to combat some of the issues and then they go like completely ape wall where it's just like yeah, we're going to make these generic options that are going to fix certain aspects of the game, but forever change how the game is played because of it, like the training boosts. So I don't necessarily know if we need like a delicate plan for everything, but uh, something not necessarily like something more should be done in order to try to limit security as a threat in of itself. And I guess like and I get that's part of the game. But at the same time, it is easily the worst aspect of the game outside of some of their more recent designs. Mm -hmm. Of which I'm going to go ahead and throw this out there. That's actually kind of why Machine Dramon, despite being as slow as it is and what it can do, it actually has the ability to take advantage of, like you said, the trashing ability. Because now, after the entirety of the Rapid Mon coming out in the structure deck, it now has two ways in both black green to trash security when it deletes a Digimon. So now, as we move forward, the more we get that, the more likely Machine Dramon is going to get stronger and stronger to where its redirect is just going to be a thing of fear because you do not want it to redirect to you to where you're just like, okay, I trash five security. Well, the the... There's pros and cons to everything. So, like, the pros of something like Machine Dramon, like, are really, really good. But the cons are what's keeping it in check in of itself. And the cons could be a matchup or the cons could be the deck's own natural inconsistencies towards its own playstyle. I was about to say, styles. you want to build a brick, you want to build a house with that deck? So, like, that's, that's where I feel like certain things can be mitigated like i love the ace mechanic i love it a lot the fact that you have this like new level of interaction is really exciting um but it does come at its own risk because of the overflow mechanic putting itself in balance and i feel like right now with the way they've been printing certain like security options and recovery and other stuff like there's there's not really much of a balance and i get like again going back to japanese game design they like those big splashy exciting moments uh but at the same time some of those moments are also what can be extremely frustrating uh, where you're just sitting there, the opponent in like a Bloom Lord deck is just playing out like 50 memory worth of cards uh, for basically free and just doing a whole bunch of nonsense. And sometimes that can be like a little bit on the frustrating side. So like they're yeah. they're finding a good balance and hopefully this new design team, uh, whoever they are, actually is able to take what happened here learn from what happened here and make it so that it doesn't happen again. Because like I kind of mentioned it on Facebook or whatever um, and on social media, like when security control wins, we all lose. And I feel like that's still true, even though Peter's a fantastic player. Again, nothing to shame about him for picking the right deck that won him worlds. It's just from a conceptual level and from a TO level, it was probably the most excruciatingly painful thing that anyone could endure. Yeah. And that's why it has like such a stigma. So, 
But, yeah. I'm just hoping to have more fun in the upcoming formats, because with Unification on the horizon, I'm really afraid if they're going to keep Japan a BO1 format, a best of one, or uh, if they're going to integrate them to a best of three. Uh, they're probably going to keep it at best of one. Japan has no reason not to. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're still going to keep it best of three. But I think, like, even though best of one is just one game, a lot of what we take is from Japan as of right now. So, like, there's still enough parallels where even though it's best of one or best of three, like, we're still almost the exact same. In terms of, like, the cards that we're playing with. Uh, and it really just comes down to promo distribution on how different the format is. Because we've seen promos come into play. Uh, and the sad thing is, I'm just going to highlight this right now. We still don't have the rest of the Survive promos. And that's inexcusable at this point. Because Japan is actually starting to use some of those. Because mm -hmm. you have uh, Drachmon which interacts with Undead, which we're getting more Undead cards. And you also have a new Kunimon that interacts with Bugs. So, like, we those cards are slowly becoming more and more relevant. And the fact that we don't have them is, like, it's actually kind of pathetic. And Unification, uh, we've kind of been, like, everyone is kind of, like, cautiously optimistic on how unification is going to be handled if it's going to be like actually good for the game like if anything what this kind of shows in terms of worlds is like i think unification would be good because the, uh, again it just makes an event like worlds just easier to run because now the japanese players don't have to retroactively think back to bt15 with alternate rule sets that they weren't playing with uh that's the other difference on how things can change is uh ban and restrictions but mm -hmm. um because that's what made this event feel like a very wild west and i would have liked to see uh more on the stage being promoted than what actually was mm -hmm. yeah. but unification is going to be very very interesting because next worlds should theoretically be under unification theoretically uh because i think like what their plan was it, it uh be by march It'll be right after worlds actually no it will be next worlds because no, they, they said spring of 2024 worlds will be the literally january of 2024 uh they changed the world state every year uh the first year it was in december or not december january uh last year it was february this year was march like it's it's just early 2024 or early 2025 is when worlds is going to be we don't know the exact date neither does bandai um because they're still working that out but uh it's just cool to see like we could get a trip to japan and it's just cool to see everyone like playing the game uh regardless of what language you started in because I think like they're also trying to catch China up as well, so maybe Worlds yeah, will be China a little bit the, bigger. China has been we having will. combo sets after combo sets, well, right? It's also so the fact maybe that China has the promo, the, the survive promos right now. So maybe they will learn from how they've been handling the Chinese market, how to actually do double or like combo sets to make them not feel so bad, like what we have experienced. Uh, because my biggest fear is like, oh. Uh, special booster 2.0 and 2.5 or whatever they call oh, the, the two me. sets uh, they could end up being scuffed like a lot of the other sets which incidentally falls in the exact same time frame as when all of the other scuff sets came out but regardless um, I think unification is definitely going to be a really big thing and I think this year is already like now that we're past worlds and hopefully Bandai learns something from Worlds and is able to take away something. Hopefully that's just going to improve the game. And that's what I really want is just the game to constantly get better. Uh, I was listening to uh, some people say that they haven't played the game in over a year. And they came back and they think the game is even better than when they left it. And that's like hearing that really put a smile on my face 
because that shows that the game is getting better. The community is getting bigger. And even though we're not like One Piece level big, uh, we're not Battle Spirits level small either. Uh, so we actually can have a decently sized presence in the TCG space that could hold its own against some of the other games that are currently in the market. Especially now, that's super important. Okay, so... So... Mm -hmm. But... So, with all this uh, talk about Worlds and BT15, uh, what do you guys think is going to be Later. good... What do you guys oh, think is going to be uh, a good into the uh, BT fifteen meta? Like, what are you what are you excited to play, and what are what do you think is going to be played? Right now, a lot of people are on bunnies, so like that's like what I think is going to be played a lot right now is bunnies. People are it's it's a brand new deck. People want to play it. Uh, Honestly, that, I'm still going to be on my Masty train because I'm just a Masty Mon player. Uh -huh. I mean, that's fair. Masty Mon's uh, still good. Bunnies, uh, like right now, right now, Nume is getting like it's hard to say because like we need to like I'm trying to think of like things that are just going to be re like good regardless of what happens. Like Nume gets better and better. Like we can't stop that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Ukulele's just a disgusting are, card. Yeah. Um, other things are like like Red Hybrid still gets good. Bloom I think is gonna fall off. Um, like it hasn't done good. I don't GP think Bloom is gonna fall now. off as of right now. Mm -hmm. I think it Bloom has... just needs to shift its ideas on its play style. So, like, Bloom might need to not focus so much on the wide board and it's focusing more on the combo play using the wide board as it's getting wider. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Because I think, like, obviously looking at uh, kind of like pseudo tier listing it, I definitely think, like, Leviah is going to see a lot more play. I think, obviously, Bunnies being the deck is, like, the newest deck is going to see a lot more play. Same thing with, like, Security Control. Uh, those are probably going to be what I think is, and then Numimon. That's probably what I think is going to be, like, tier one is Bunnies... Levia, uh, Numa. If we're going by strictly tier base, I don't think Numa is going to be in the tier one section on that. I think it, it will. It it will. Uh, that deck is absurdly disgusting, and if you don't have the ability to control, uh, really quickly, which uh Bunnies does to keep it in check, then it could go absolutely ballistic. Mm hmm. So that's kind of like that's kind of the triangle of tier one that I would say is you have like bunnies, Leviamon, and Numimon, where it's just like Numimon will feed on the Leviamon, Leviamon will feed on the bunnies, and then uh, bunnies will feed on Numimon. All right. And then well, I think the everything's kind of going to get spread out from there. Yeah, if we go into the, kind of like a tier two kind of thing, I think stuff like Mirage and Melga are going to be kind of up there at the top not melga after the hit melga after the hit's a lot harder to play it's I still think... just the same melga of just build the stack and go burr yeah i think like the the otk and combo based decks are definitely more like good tier two contention because they're always just going to be good so that's where the mirage the lugerman the shine like probably i would blue. actually move shine closer to the tier three maybe low tier two because of what new is able to do in terms of tame destruction uh i mean it's it depending on how wide the format gets in terms of different decks like that actually might be negligible because if you don't see it then it just doesn't happen so like because when we get into too wide of a format, it does become very hard to be able to prep and tech for everything, uh, which is why certain decks do generally well is because they just don't care about how the format shapes up. They're just playing to their own strengths 
And that's why they end up still doing very, very well, which is why Bloom has always been one of the best green decks for a very long time is because he's the only one that doesn't care about what the opponent is doing. Almost all of the other green decks care. Um, and that's kind of like also where Red Hybrids is, where Red Hybrids is probably just the discount Numemon at this point, where it's a good aggressive deck, but it's not as aggressive. But it does have some alternative play lines that still make it a very strong deck, especially into a lot of the control decks, because he does have like the built in ADP. And then I think based mm -hmm. on worlds, stuff that can run ADP probably is going to run more, especially if we do end up seeing more Leviamons. So like Fenrir. Probably is gonna drop the um drop the chaos, uh or not chaos, um death X and start running ADP a little bit more. They already are. Yeah. Looking into like like right now they're not on it because they're they're afraid of it. Uh but heading into like next format you kinda do need it. Yeah. And then yeah, like so I think like there's still gonna be a very good healthy spread of decks and seeing that develop is going to be really really fun because i'm playing in a lot of these events and i gotta figure out what the heck i'm supposed to be doing uh because i'm like do i give in and be the toxic cancer that is control uh at least this is my perception of it because i'm an aggro player and aggro hates control or do i just double down on the aggro and shift to something like numimon from my red hybrids and mirage decks that i generally like to play not I saying think... that those decks are bad it's just do i go f one step further with it i think for you to like numa you're gonna have to sit down and play it for like a week playing it for the one time it's very much like the the aggression of like red hybrid but it's very hard to pilot the first time around like you really need to know like effects rulings and strategies because it, it, it is very explosive but at the same time there are a lot of brick hands yeah, yeah. i agree on that 100 percent. for me i'm sticking with mirage at least for bt15 format because it does well enough obviously against like levy i get screwed over really hard um but, but against of, Numimon and bunnies, like, you could do pretty well. Yeah, yeah. Against those ones, I'm a lot better at controlling the board. It like armor purge is a mechanic that I vehemently hate, um, just because like it gets around deletion, and deletion is like supposed to be king in the format in the game, but it's like stuff can kind of get rid of the deletion, and it's very hard to stabilize a game when you go to delete the board and like everything stays. That's kind of why yeah. I was looking at, like, Melga also. Like, because there is a lot of uh, deletion-based protection, uh, having the removal types to get around that is probably going to be super prominent. So, like, even though you might think Melga not, might not be as good, I think it's still going to be a pretty decent contender just because if it could uh, fit not necessarily into an OTK uh, build, but go into a more mid rangey build... And just remove the threats before they become a threat and control the field before it gets out of control. Like, I think it could still do very well. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's kind of just our general. Oh, uh, what are so what are you excited to play and play against or expecting to see Guardian? Oh, yeah, honestly, already... I'm a, I'm expecting to see a lot of rabbits. I'm also expecting this. Because I tested this already against Nikki, I'm expecting to see a more control-based Magnamon running around. Because right now, yeah, yellow vaccines uh, can do very well. No, 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 not yellow vaccine. No, Magnamon. There, there, there's four builds of Magna running around right now, and it, it there's there's a lot in 16 format. It's very diverse, but it, it, it kind of boils down to the same numbers game of Magnamon is your top end because Magnamon is a busted card. Magnamon X. Uh, but it comes down to, like, what base are you running? Our friend Headless Honcho is on Yellow Vaccine into Magnamon. Our friend Garden here is into Magnamon into Magnamon. And then our third friend who wants to build a deck is on Armor Rush into Magna. And you might think that might that's the same. No, he's on Rydramon and Shako and Flamedramon into the Magnamon. And I'm just like, you don't need the Flamedramon. You already get DP when you check the security. 
but he's very want he wants like a lot of armors in the trash and like I understand it, but we there's like three strategies for them, and me and Honcho are also on bugs are a good deck because we get high enough to where it doesn't matter what you try to do, it's have the option or we're just gonna make you run into us. Yeah, and of honestly, this is I'm not looking to... forward to the mirrors. The mirror, the VT sixteen is gonna be tier one format, and uh, get ready for the mirrors because oh god, those mirrors are god awful. I think BT-16 will be fine, but that's not going to be until uh, May. May. So we and still that's when got we some get time. to the store regionals, too. Yeah. Uh, which I think... Oh, that's the other thing. Uh, we actually do get, uh, as a good way to end things off on, uh, we do get store regionals. So stores uh, get a special event that they have to sign up for and apply for, and they could basically be that like intermediary uh, in-between tournament that me and nako were always complaining about uh in the wolf den podcast uh or season one if you want to call it that um but that was something that we always kind of wanted out of the tournament scene and the fact that they finally announced that we're getting that is like a godsend it's like the greatest thing they could have done the fact that it comes with regional level prizing it's a player cap of 64 it's a local thing it's going to be held at various different locations uh it's in person it's it's definitely looking like that is is gonna be a great thing for that yes uh i think that's like easily one of the best things bandai could have announced and uh i'm definitely excited to see where mine are so i could try to sign up and participate in those Mm -hmm. oh which nikki i need your opinion on this if you can look at it what am i looking at Hold up. What am I looking at? So we'll talk about this later. Like th- this is more nuanced than we have time for the show. Yeah. yeah so I but for think... store regionals, I'm worried for only three reasons, and that's because of how regionals are in. During uh... this time, if we don't get other regionals, people are gonna be applying to a lot of store regionals, and it's gonna be lot either lottery system or first come first serve. Do invites pass down and only top eight get them out of 64 people. i honestly am one to say the invite should be passed down but that's but up to bondi it, it, it on that be one down, but the thing is what happens when so this is my fear are they going to spread out the days to where it's like oh it's not just on saturdays we're gonna have it on like some wednesdays some tuesdays it's up to the store discretion to yeah. try to make it more available for people, but because it's more available, you're going to get the same people who keep going to the event because you're supposed to get regional level pricing, which will flood the market and bring all these prices down, which I'm happy for because e- EP6 is really nice. Yeah, um, and what's not stopping people for going into other states if they're close to the border? Like, I could just mm-hmm. uh, take a trip uh, to Ohio, just as an example, and I could maybe participate in some of theirs as well. So or I, th- I think the there's going to be Nick some and I go to Vegas, for example, for that. Yeah, we could go to Vegas for California people, but like also, is it, do we need to pay for it still? Because you'll, you'll need to, it's free. You'll need likely to like, yeah. going to be. You'll need to pay for it because it's right by the store. Paying? Hold up on that. We actually do have a question from Shooting Slayer. He's asking what decks are going to be good for July? july uh that should be bt 16 that's gonna be 16 ex6 format not not 16 16 releases may yeah that that, again that is still the same format yeah it's 16 ex6 so uh right now we're still learning on what japan is doing uh demon lords is looking pretty strong but that's pretty far out to where we don't exactly have a decisive answer um because right now we're still just focused on what our BT-15 is going to look at being really different than Japan's BT-15. And then we also have zero idea how Bandai's execution on store regionals is going to be. I think we're going to go through some growing pains when it comes to store regionals. But we'll we'll end up working through it as a community. And I it, it'll be interesting to see what the outcome is going to be with the store regionals and how things are going to be changing because of that on top of uh just all of the events that they're usually going to be running on their usual schedule yeah because not to mention we don't know if we're still going to get a regionals during this time because if we are that's going to skew data as well because if we don't get any regionals uh store regionals 
might just end up being uh, on Eggman's sites just because it's the only regional data we have. Um, because like we are mm-hmm. doing real regionals, and if they are doing real regionals, and then it we kind of again comes down to like I couldn't even get into my own local. I couldn't get into regional regionals. Like what is the what is the point? And it's like I'm not mad. I just kind of like it's very hard to say like how they're gonna do the system because it's a very nice idea. But it's going to be hard to implement because you're going to get the same people who keep going into these tournaments, keep paying their money because, like, at the end of the day, for them, it's a money investment. Because even if I scrub out, I get my EP six packs and I can sell those off for for basically what I came in for, and then, or I could just keep trading when I keep whenever I come in for the ones I do want, and then I'm I'm golden. Yeah, but you're going to so... get people who with invites that like top players out here in like in like um in California, they they go to their locals, they go to other locals, they like the variety. But when they keep going to the same place and keep winning, you get the one guy who's passed down seven invites. Yeah, mm-hmm. it, it it'll be interesting. There's there's going to be some growing pains, mm-hmm. uh, but hopefully they could take everything that they're learning and just put it towards bettering the game, and that's all we could really hope for. Because I do think so we next kind of got off the topic of the question on that one. We well, went off it's right to be back. Good right now, it's just going to be magna bugs. And then, like, the old, like, generally good grind decks. Because decks are going to come to a grind. And it's just, how do you... It's going to be DP Wars. So, Luga's going to be somewhat good. It's going to be hard to fight into certain matchups. But the main two idiots I see that are going to be fighting people tooth and nail are going to be the sleeper hit Bugs and Magnamon. Magnas are... The Bugs aren't sleeper anymore. People are already jumping on buying on the high rarity on those. Yeah, I'm sorry, Same man. with the Magna stuff. You got priced out of Bugs really hard. Oh, uh, it's okay. I probably the other gonna one that anyway. is gonna be kind of contender, and this is just because of the ability for them to rush as fast as bloody possible. Will be birds. They're not no. gonna be as strong no. as no. Magna or no. Bugs. No. Even even Honcho says like the 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 BT sixteen stuff for birds is cracked. Uh, but you still lose to a Magna uh, bug. Like, I'm not you don't denying have that. Enough, enough DP. Like, the problem Birds has is that you have to play the crappy tie to start trying to win a DP war that the other decks have already won. E- yeah. Mm-hmm. But I it's think I'm still saying, wrong, advocating but... that there will be still pretty good to use. Yeah. When you when you have an an, immu- uh, an immovable blocker that will just take your attack, and your main gameplay strategy is I'm going to hit you, and that's it. Uh, the deck falls apart. Like, it's still good, but it's going to be how quickly can you get your combo when other decks like Magna and Tyrant just go, I'm going to my six. Sorry, Slayer. Command or slash D Brigade is not going to be very competitive during the July format. No, they just are good. way too slow and they can't get around it's, bugs. It's not that they're slow. It's just, it's just the fact that they get walled everyone out. has teched out options to make matchups easier that D Brigade falls into, like Crimson Blaze and generally Mm -hmm. like dp deletion yeah but uh i think this is going to be a good place to close it there's a lot of good stuff to look forward to so i want to thank everyone for listening to this episode of the podcast and if you want to support the podcast please make sure to share it with others on social media as well as leaving that like follow subscribe and review depending on your platform that you're listening on and i want to thank you all again And we will see you next time.